in October 1st and December 24, 2018. The stock market collapsed. I mean, the uh, the Dow Jones, the S&P, uh, and the NASDAQ all fell about 20%, just short of a bear market. It was like 19.8%, you know, 20% to all intents and purposes. But that was in less than three months. And the Fed kept raising rates in the middle of the stock market crash. This shows you how out of touch they are and how behind the curve they are. So the last rate hike was December... Uh, 14th or 15th, they got to look at the calendar. It was, it was right right around the middle of December, 14th or 15th. Even after two months of crashing stock prices, they raised rates one last time. They just kept going and kind of what we were, what we were talking about earlier. And then finally on December 24th, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre, the NASDAQ fell 3% in one day. The Dow was like about 1.8%, S&P was over two, and, and the NASDAQ was 3%. And then the, the Fed got religion, like, oh, we went too far. Uh, we're the last to know, as always. So early January 2019, Powell said, use the word patient. It's one of those code words. It means patient means we're not going to raise rates unless we tell you. So they were on pause. And then by late 2019, they cut rates. And then along came COVID. And by March 2020, they were back to zero. You had this huge round trip from zero in November 2015 to about two and a quarter, two and a half in DC 2018, back down to zero by March 2020. Like, what was that all about? Well, the Fed went too far, didn't know what they were doing. The economy was weaker than they expected and they raised rates. So, so bring that scenario forward to today. I feel like I'm watching the same movie which is, okay, the Feds, they got the gumption, they raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. Now they're much higher than they were in 2018, but they're flying into a hurricane. They're flying into a very weak economy, seen by a lot of metrics, housing stars, global trade, ISM surveys, industrial output, inventories. There's, there's tons of negative data. It's not the kind of thing that people, doesn't make their headlines the way CPI does, but it's all there, it's hard data. So it looks like a bigger, better version of what happened in 2018, and I would expect a worse outcome. So my point is the Fed may in fact rate, sorry, the Fed may in fact cut rates sooner than Wall Street expects, sooner than Michael Wilson expects, but not for good reasons, but for very bad reasons, because we're in a severe recession. So, so the bottom line is we've had the supply side inflation. Now, we have not seen it come from the demand side, but let's say you're the Fed, okay? All you want to do is get inflation under control. You kind of don't care where it's coming from. You just want to get it down to 2%. So then the question is, okay, how how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about, and explain why that's their number. The answer is they're making progress, but they're not there yet. And he's... And this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26th, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control. But he said, inflation's way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. We know unemployment's going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer. Unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. And so in other words, too bad, you know, well, the Fed has no tools to affect the supply side. The Fed doesn't drive trucks. They don't drill for oil. They don't plant crops. They don't run tractors. They don't do anything that could alleviate the, su the supply side problems. All the Fed can do is destroy demand and that they can do. When you raise interest rates enough, mortgage rates go up, credit card rates go up, you know, cost of working capital go up. All that tends to slow the economy and it causes people to tighten their belts. But just think of the conundrum. The, the inflation is coming from the supply side. The Fed can't do anything about the supply side, but they can crush demand, which should reduce inflation. But how much do you have to crush demand when that's not the problem? It's coming from the supply side. How much demand do you have to destroy to actually affect the supply side? The answer is a lot. And this is what Jay Powell has been saying. Unemployment has to go up. We're, we're, we're going to be in a recession. We got to crush this thing before it gets out of control. And you got to crush it even more because that's not even where the inflation is coming from. It's coming from the supply side. Supply chain bottlenecks have been alleviated to some extent, not 
not completely by any means. And uh, it was always a case of popping up here and there. You know, it's not like you went into a supermarket and all the shelves were bare. It wasn't East Germany in the 1950s, but something would be missing. You know, it could be the peanut butter one day or the, the canned goods the next or spaghetti the week after that. That has uh, alleviated to some extent, not, not completely. But again, the reason it has been alleviated is a very bad one which is that demand is down. In other words, the Fed is destroying demand, so people are buying less. So, you know, grocers and retailers and boutiques and suppliers are able to keep more things on the shelf, not because all the logistics problems have been solved, but because the demand is down, because that's what the Fed's doing. So supply chain better, yes, but for good reasons or bad reasons? Well, it's for bad reasons because demand is down. And that's another thing leading us into a recession. So a, a couple of things. We should probably, without taking too much for granted, we should probably just define BRICS. It's an acronym. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So those are the BRICS. And started in 2002 as a Goldman Sachs marketing gimmick. Uh, Jim O'Neill and some partners came up with it. Uh, and all they did, I'm not, I'm not diminishing what they did, but they kind of took the leading economies, took out the G7 and Switzerland and a couple of obvious leaders and said, well, who's left? Uh, that will be the up and comers, the fastest growing developing economies. Then they got Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That was kind of easy. And then a few years later, they added South Africa, uh, which was a little bit of a favorite of South Africa. South Africa is not anywhere near as large as those other economies or as important. However, it is one of the biggest economies in Africa. And if you're going to do, if you're going to be the BRICS, you probably can't just be South America and Asia. You probably need to include an African country. So they picked South Africa. So for a couple of years, it was a Goldman marketing brochure. But then in 2006, at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, annual meeting. You know, heads of state and foreign ministers show up from all over the world, but they have what they call these bilateral meetings on the sidelines. And sometimes there are three or four say, hey, we're all here, let's just grab a conference room and sit down and talk. Well, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, um, they sat down and they said, yeah, we actually have a lot in common, a lot to talk about, and we added it up, we're, we're a pretty powerful group. So they formalized it. And then in 2009, they had a summit conference, a formal summit conference with an agenda and all that in uh, Ekaterinburg in Russia, in the Russian Federation. And they, they solidified, okay, we're a group, we're gonna work together, and they did. And over the coming years, they, they multiplied numerous, numerous. People say it's the BRICS meeting. They have about 190 meetings a year. They have working groups on uh, women's rights, uh, sports, the environment, climate change, you know, it could go on and on. It, it's a very active, what they call secretariat, which is, you know, central organization. A few years later, in 2014, they formed what they call the New Development Bank, NDB. Well, what's the New Development Bank? First of all, it's got 100 billion of capital, part paid in, part callable, uh, but it also has borrowing power with that kind of ownership and that kind of capital on the balance sheet. They've got hundreds of billions of dollars of borrowing power. They could easily get a, a, a pretty good credit rating. Uh, and the, the purpose is to make loans for development projects to the member countries. And by the way, there are stockholders of the New Development Bank who are not BRICS, but they're kind of in the club. Well, what does that sound like? The World Bank on their own terms with their own governance. Okay, the following year, they created something called the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. Well, what's that? Again, they threw in a couple hundred billion dollars from the members, China was the biggest contributor. Again, with borrowing power, so take a couple hundred billion times five or 10, you're, that's, that's your power. And this institution was designed to be a swing lender to members who were running a trade deficits or facing a run on their currency or facing the prospect of having to close the capital account, exactly what we saw in 1997, 98, by the way, I was there for that one, we ended up with long-term capital. Well, a pool that is a swing lender to countries with a balance of payments deficit, what does that sound like? That's the IMF. So basically they copy the World Bank, they copy the IMF. And I wanna make two points. Number one, it's not like the BRICS popped up six months ago and said, hey, we're gonna have a new currency. You know, it's like get Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland putting on a play. This has been in the works for 17 years. And it's typical Russian, Chinese, they're very methodical. So they duplicate the World Bank, they duplicate the IMF. Now they have a applicants for membership and there are, I think 21 or more countries 
who have applied for, well, seven have formally applied for membership. They filled out their college essay and they want to be members. And then another 13 or 14 on the waiting list, so to speak, and uh, will perhaps eventually become members. But when you add those in, some of these will be admitted starting with Saudi Arabia. Okay, so what happens when you let Saudi Arabia into the BRICS, <laughs> given the other members? You have two of the three largest oil producers in the world, mm -hmm. Russia and Saudi Arabia. You have two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world, Russia and China. You have, you know, throwing India in and some others, you have uh, about 50% of global population, 54% of global GDP using purchasing power parity. That's, you can debate the method, but just if you do purchasing power parity, you get over half of, of G GDP, 30% of the global land mass. I could go on and on. My point is, you know, I did, I learned development economics in the 1970s. We had something called the third world. It was like, it was Russia or, you know, Soviet Union and the U.S. And then there was the third world. And all you knew about them was they were poor and, you know, you had to get them off the runway. We actually had a, a, the runway theory of how you grow. Turned out to be wrong, but that's what we learned. Well, this is not the old third world. These are not basket cases. These are many of the biggest economies in the world that collectively have enormous power, natural resources, uh, gold reserves, landmass, population, military, and again, it could go down the list, but this is a block that is as powerful in its own way by a lot of these metrics as the collective West, which would, I would call, you know, US, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and a few others. So that's who this group is. Now there are a couple other groups that may join forces with the BRICS. Uh, there's something called the Eurasian Economic Union. And I was like, what the heck is that? Well, this goes back to the, uh, early 2000s. This was Putin's answer to the EU. He said, well, you got the EU, we got the EEU. Now it's Russia and some Central Asian republics, some, you know, Belarus and Tajikistan. I'm not saying this is France, Germany and Italy, but it is a, a group that have reduced tariffs and improved trade between themselves. And there's another powerful group called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization mm -hmm. led by China. And these are mostly Central Asian republics, including uh, Kazakhstan and some others. But but they're all talking to each other. Now, what's the common denominator? Well, it's basically Russia and China. Uh, China's a member of two. Russia is the only country in the world that's a member of all three. So through pretty simple inference, you can say, hey, Russia and China are running the show. And it's very likely that when this thing plays out, and I'll talk about the thing, I realize we're glossing over that, but when, when this new currency plays out, that those other countries will join in. When you do that, and I got I found a really cool widget, it's a map of the world that's blank, and you can go country by country and fill in by color, just you know, click on it and give it a color. And I did that. And I was like, okay, here's the BRICS, it's five countries or whatever. Well, here are the, here are the applicants, it has another 20. And here's the SCO, a few more. Some of them are members of both. Here's the EEU, it has a few more. Again, many are members of both. And you keep going. And all of a sudden, like a light bulb goes on. I said, that that is Halford McKinder's global island, the, what he called the world oh. island. And then this goes back early 20th century, first probably greatest geopolitical theorist in history. Got to read his book if you haven't read it, it's pretty short. But he had this idea of, of the world island. That is exactly what they're building. Now, why is that important other than uh, the obvious, which is you know more collective economic and population power. By the way, output of wheat, pick your metric. They, this dominates the world. Well, for one thing, if you're going to have a currency union, the more countries you have, the more likely you are to be successful. Let's just kind of digress for a second. And what are the headlines saying? China and Saudi Arabia are talking about selling oil for yuan. Brazil and China do large multi-currency deal where they accept each other's currency. UAE, China, same thing, selling oil for yuan. Uh, Russia, China, using yuan and rubles as payment methods for whatever they sell to each other. You know, Russia sells natural resources, China sells semiconductors, manufactured goods, and so forth. And there are a number of those, I don't have to list them all, but there are 10 or 15 of these. The reason they've all fallen short, and very few of them have actually come to fruition despite the headlines, is when you have two countries and they're gonna trade with each other and accept each other's currency, and you can do that, you're limited to what you can do with that currency. This is why the Russia-India thing is starting to break down. Russia has been pumping oil to India. India has been paying in rupees, but how much curry do you need? And Russia's starting to balk. They're like, hey, we, we, we're up to our eyeballs in rupees. Let's, we need a better system. Well, when you have a, a multilateral, multi-country currency union, 
that problem goes away. Now, Russia sells oil to China. China pays in bricks, the brick currency pays you in brick. But Russia can take the brick and turn around to Argentina and say, we'd like to buy, or Brazil maybe, and we'd like to buy some Embraer aircraft. And Brazil gets the brick currency and they can turn around to China and say, we'd like to buy some rice. And then China takes, et cetera. And so you've solved the quasi barter problem. I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do, and you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then what are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates three to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need three to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from let's say a half of 1%, then you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25. You didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend. And the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want to kids' education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. They're like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money away. I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings, and, and I think he's right about that. So back to the problem. How do you cut interest rates to 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't. So you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession. But they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on. But in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June, 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, the technical definition of a recession is Two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half two, that gap between let's say one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, 
but they do die. And we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. Why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this. And he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he he was a great scholar of the Great Depression. And he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today. But he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get. Nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II. And they go, huh, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. That was they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up and the Fed's watching, watching, watching. And then it keeps going and they go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates and they raise rates. But of course they started too late. The expansion keeps going, inflation keeps going up, unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down, unemployment goes up and then prices go down and capacity utilization drops and we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut and then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over 30 or so times since the end of World War II with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. That is a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December for 2017, 2018 into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, All right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now, I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike? Under what conditions will they not raise rates? 
because this everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patients out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year and they weren't going to do the lift off that, that people were looking for in March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015. And Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause in Dudley's recent remarks. Pause is the Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed as their scenario, or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs, so Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, non a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets, more than 5%. If you see a 6, 7, 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points, in a disorderly way. It looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. The inflation peaked around 9%, but it has been coming down. It's still too high. It's still way above the Fed's target. They say we want 2%, but I've never felt that 2% was the right target for inflation. I always thought it should be zero. If you believe in price stability, you wouldn't want any inflation and you wouldn't want any deflation. You would want price stability. Now, of course, you're never going to get it exactly there, but the target in that world would be zero, maybe a little bit below, a little bit above, but you'd always be steering to zero. That means you're not stealing anyone's money through inflation. You're not enriching creditors through deflation. You're not distorting the allocation of capital by either one. You're just saying we want stable money. That's kind of the Fed's job. Then the question is, why is it 2%? And you know, I disagree with Milton Friedman on a lot of things, but Milton Friedman said zero. He didn't think it should be 2%. He thought zero was the right number. I agree with that. So why is it 2%? Well, the Fed has a rationale. Um, the rationale is every now and then you have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, bail out the stock market. You just need a rate cut. And the evidence is pretty good that negative rates don't work. They have been tried for years in Japan, Switzerland, uh, I believe Sweden for a while, um, and, and the ECB, uh, but they don't do anything. They don't uh, stimulate. In fact, they often do the opposite of what they're intended to do. Let me give you a, a concrete example. So the idea is if I cut interest rates you know, lower and lower, as a saver or an investor, I'm going to say, well, I don't like those 
low yields, um, you know, put money in the bank, I only get, you know, a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or whatever. So I'll go buy some treasury notes or I'll go buy some stocks. And that's called the portfolio channel effect. In other words, by keeping rates so low, you make simple savings and liquid investments unattractive and you drive investors to other investments, housing, stocks, bonds, whatever, commodities perhaps. And then that creates a wealth effect. And if my assets go up, I feel more prosperous. And maybe I spend more money and that helps the economy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the theory. It's all garbage, by the way. But there's, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. I mean, yeah, assets go up, people feel a little better about it. But the idea that they turn around and spend more money does not hold up. Uh, the people with the most assets tend to have the most discretionary income. And, you know, once you got a couple of cars and a couple of houses, you know, and a, a decent wardrobe, you're actually going to go spend more money. Well, probably not. You'll probably save it or invest it. I'm not saying those are bad things, but the idea that it stimulates the economy is not true. But if you follow the theory and say, okay, lower rates force you into to asset purchases, et cetera, wouldn't negative rates do even more of that? Because what's what happens with a negative rate? You have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at a negative one percent interest rate, I take on the on the government or the treasury or the bank, I'm taking a a thousand dollars a year. I'm taking one percent out of your account. So you're sitting there. You just say, hey, I just want to save $100,000, that's all I want. But with a negative rate, it goes 99, 98, 97. And the idea there is, well, now you're really going to spend your money because it's kind of use it or lose it. Again, these are kind of theories, but let me kind of ground that in the real world a little bit. What do people actually think? When they see negative rates, they, people say to themselves, huh, there must be deflation coming. You know, the economy must be in really bad shape. Deflation must be getting the upper hand. Why else would they go to negative rates if they weren't worried about deflation, and if they are worried about deflation, and they are, then I'm going to save more. I mean, far from getting people to spend, uh, remember, the dollar is worth more. In a deflationary world, your dollars are actually worth more. In real terms, a dollar can be, you're just a bank account, can be your best performing investment. In a deflationary world, if, if you have 2% deflation, then the real value of a, a savings account with zero interest goes up 2%. And that's probably better than what stocks are doing in that world. So people act rationally. They say, okay, we have negative rates. Central bank must be worried about deflation. If they're worried, I'm worried. And I'm going to save more because first of all, those savings will do well in deflation. Uh, you know, I need, I need to be prepared for that. The last thing I want to do is spend. If prices are going down, why would I spend? I'll wait six months, get a cheaper price. So in other words, real world behavior is the exact opposite of what central bankers predict. Central bankers predict, use it or lose it, you'll go spend the money because I'm gonna take it away. But real people say, no, I'm gonna save more because you're signaling to me that the value of the money cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that talk about China, the war in Ukraine and climate change. And you say, well, yeah, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft. They need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? You can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, Beijing, a city of 22 million people, they were both locked down entirely. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? Why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, 
better data collections, a new model. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the, the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down US-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics. China kind of re-enters the game, and all this this was this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains, and it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30-year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things, a lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do? to strike back. Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein, they don't have enough. The US and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them and China said, well, what can we buy from the US just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, etc. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the US to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts, they want five year contracts or at least three year contracts and they got them. And so now all of a sudden China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil, but this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the US farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans, we can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse, but it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date, but the 30 year period of supply chain 1.0. Now, we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. 
we blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years, or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form. I'm going to spend $50 billion to create 51% of the mining capacity in the world. And I'm going to steal all the Bitcoin in the world and take down the Western financial system. First of all, there's no such thing as cryptocurrency. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. In other words, you cannot speak generically about cryptocurrencies. With these people. Jim Rickards hates cryptocurrencies. That's not true. I really, really dislike Bitcoin, and I'll tell you why. But there are cryptocurrencies out there that I think are very interesting and, and worth uh, your consideration. Um, I'm for it. I'm against it. Cryptocurrency is, means nothing. You have to talk about the specific currency. And I'm, uh, and I'm here I'm showing uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Monero, and Ether. By the way, isn't it fascinating how the graphical representation of cryptocurrencies is always a gold or silver coin? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gold and Litecoin's silver, Monero's both, and Ether is, is gold. I mean, what are they trying to say? I think that psychologically what they're saying is, well, this is, this is nothing, but if we pretend, if we pretend it's a gold coin, then someone will buy it. Uh, but I, I just find this a little bit of an aside. But no, it's the same thing is true with fiat currencies. You can't be... Uh, like or dislike fiat currencies generically. Some people do because they just hate central banks. I understand that. But it's a big difference between a, uh, a uh, Venezuelan Bolivar and, uh, Bolivar and a, a euro, big difference between a Zimbabwe dollar and a U.S. dollar. So in other words, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. Tell me what specific one you want to talk about, and that's a more interesting conversation. I think it's really important because this, this field is so muddied. The conversation is so muddied. People not distinguishing between blockchain and currency, not, not distinguishing between different types of currencies, et cetera. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, and be rigorous in our analysis and think about what we're actually talking about. There's no such thing as a blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. In other words, every currency, every token, every um, so-called smart contract, if you're using Ether, has a different blockchain. So there are at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of blockchains, new ones being created every day. So again, don't talk to me about blockchain. Tell me which specific blockchain you're talking about because they're not all the same. And this is critical. The main difference, there are, there are many differences in this blockchain technology, but the main difference is validation. Because remember, the whole idea, the whole idea uh, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and the original Bitcoin and what Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is that we're not, we're gonna have a trustless system. We're not gonna trust banks, we're not gonna trust clearing houses, we're not gonna trust exchanges, we're not gonna trust central banks, we're not gonna trust anybody. We're gonna have a decentralized system that a community can validate and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, uh, 87 digit uh, prime numbers uh, into, or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non-sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second. But that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake. Meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on, you demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. Uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on the blockchain, I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, Byzantine Agreement, um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best, um, much more uh, uh, much more robust to some of the problems we're talking about, and there are others. But the point is, don't talk about blockchain. Say, okay, what's your what's your governance model? What's your validation model, uh, et cetera? And then, and then ask yourself, is that sustainable? Is that robust? Will that resist an attack? Are your, are your cryptocurrencies going to be stolen? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and there are no generic answers, so I, I cannot emphasize enough. Coin by coin, I hate to use the word coin, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> token by token, uh, blockchain by blockchain, be rigorous and ask yourself what's sustainable. Now, um, Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ether, and some of these other cryptocurrencies, not all of them, not all of them, but the, but the best known are going to fail. When I say fail, they're going to, you know, Bitcoin might have a, um, 
a $200 value as a uh, token for criminals, and criminals and terrorists might, might find a, a, a use case at about $200 per Bitcoin, but they're basically not going to be anywhere ne near where they are today. Why do I say that? I don't want to make a claim without backing it up. The first point is they're non-scalable. Transaction times are slow. Uh, and then when you say that to Bitcoin people, they go, aha, the Lightning Network is right around the corner. You know, Lightning's going to, we'll see. You know, they said that about Segregated Witness. They said that about some of these other solutions. They, they don't seem to get community support. They keep forking the Bitcoin, meaning one day you wake up and there's two blockchains instead of one. Or whatever happened to that whole idea that we weren't going to have inflation, that we weren't going to pull new cryptos out of thin air. But uh, these solutions, you have to understand what the solution is. So what they're saying is, Nobody has a solution for the inherent slowness, clunkiness, non-scalability of the original Bitcoin blockchain. There's no solution for that. So when you hear about solutions, what are they? Well, what they're saying is take a bunch of transactions offline. So everybody in the room could form a group, or let's say every, every coffee shop in Brooklyn, New York, or every coffee shop in Vancouver could form a group. And all the people who want to buy coffee would join that group. And we would agree, so we're in our own little bubble over here, and we would agree that all of our Bitcoin transactions uh, among each other are, don't go on the blockchain. They just get settled in this sort of separate cloud over here. And then we net them out. So, you know, I pay you five Bitcoin, and you pay the person next to you four, and he pays the lady in the back of the room 10, and she pays me seven, and we, add all, we net it out, and then periodically, and it could be daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever, we net all this stuff out, and then we take that net and we put that on the blockchain. So that the amount of transactions that have to go on the blockchain is greatly reduced, that's true. But what are, what are we doing? We've created our own network. I gotta trust the coffee shops. How do I know they're not gonna steal my money? In other words, it's only a solution because you're completely negating the original idea. Well, I'll be sure. If you want to, if you want to tear up the, tear up the original idea and start over, that's fine. But don't tell me you're adhering to the idea of a decentralized, trustless network, because you're not. All you've done is create another network. Somebody, uh, you know, I get trolled on Twitter all the time. People tell me I'm an idiot and I don't know technology and all that stuff. And then my more sour moods, I tell them I was coding uh, before they were born. But uh, as far as uh, as far as some of these um, these things are concerned. Uh, somebody said, well, you don't understand payment channels. And uh, I actually do. And I said, yeah, I understand payment channels. Uh, we, we had those in the 50s. They were called party lines, we, which is, you know, you pick up the phone and someone's talking. You've got to ask them to get off the phone so you could go. In other words, there was an AT&T network, at least in the United States, but other people could jump in on this little side thing. You know, that's all it is. These are party lines. So uh, that, that doesn't work. Non-sustainable. The energy usage to do, to solve the problem and make the proof of work in Bitcoin is now greater than the annual energy output of Ireland. Imagine taking all the electricity used in Ireland in a year, and that's how much we have to use to, to crunch numbers. By the way, every applied mathematician will tell you that prime factoring is a trivial problem. It, it's like an uninteresting, not an uninteresting problem, but it takes a lot of computing power to do it because the numbers are so big and the possibilities are so great. So we're just wasting the entire electrical usage of Ireland in a few years, it's going to be the entire electrical usage of Japan. Who thinks, who in this room thinks that governments are going to allow Bitcoin miners to use as much electricity in a year as the entire country of Japan, the third largest economy in the world? That's not going to happen. It's, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not very green. It's not very, it's completely wasteful. In other words, it, it, can't, it can't happen. So that's why I say it's not sustainable. It's going to hit a wall. Non-regulated, you know, I don't have to remind you of all the frauds, new ones popping up every day. Um, and it's not just exchanges. Uh, exchanges are, how do exchanges work? Well, you know, you, I want to go to a Bitcoin exchange. Well, you got to go and you got to open an account, just like Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, right? So, uh, you know, or, or, T, or Toronto Dominion. So you go, you give me your name, your address, your social security number, your bank wire information, give them all that information, and then send them dollars and they say, okay, you got some Bitcoin, here's your confirmation. Really, how do I know you didn't just take my dollars and send me a phony baloney confirmation? How do I know you're not um, you know, a, a Ponzi, you're using new money to pay off the old money? How do I know you're not Bernie Madoff in, uh, you know, with, a, with a computer engineering degree? Uh, how do I know you're not a bucket shop? How do I know any of those things? The answer is you don't. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, not to mention Bitcoin whales. They, they estimate there are 1,000 people who control 40% of the Bitcoin. 
Now you got millennials buying, you know, one one hundredth of a Bitcoin for, you know, 10 bucks or whatever the math is, 100 bucks. Uh, but you got these, I call them the whales, these thousand people who have 40% of all the Bitcoin. You don't think they have a big vested interest in keeping the price up? And you don't think they wash trade, do wash sales? So A sells to B for 10,000, B sells back for 11,000, A sells back for 12,000, B sells back for 13,000. This is called painting the tape. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and there's no profit and loss because we're selling the same Bitcoin back and forth. But what we are doing is creating a ticker that gets the millennials, I shouldn't pick up millennials, the three millennial children, but gets uh, people all over the world, maybe a, a garage mechanic in South Korea took out a home equity loan or hocked his inventory, put his entire life savings into Bitcoin and has now been wiped out and is desperate and suicidal. That's what's going on. It's basically rich people stealing from the poor. Uh, not a good business model in my view. And then finally, uh, there's no use case other than the criminals, terrorists, or tax evaders. Why is Bitcoin better than Visa unless you're a criminal? Now, if you're a criminal, I get it. If you're buying child pornography, uh, you want to use the dark web and use some cryptos and all that. And if you try doing that with Visa, you'll probably get a call from the FBI. So I understand why it's good for criminals. But if you're not a criminal, if you're not a tax evader, if you're not buying child pornography, if you're not an arms dealer, if you're not a terrorist, then why is Bitcoin better than Visa? Um, there's really no use case for it other than crime. Um, and then it's non-elastic. And this is uh, important because there's a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoin. They're getting closer to that level every day. When, and everyone's like, this is a good thing because, you know, the problem with central banks is they print all this money and we're going to have inflation. By the way, we haven't had any inflation for the last eight years. Separate issue. I'll come to that if we don't run out of time. But, um, uh, you know, we hate central banks. They print too much money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin, but, but, but money supply has to be elastic. It can't be too elastic. The problem with central bank money is that it's too elastic, too elastic. The reason, by the way, gold is such a good form of money is that it grows slowly. It grows at about the tempo of world growth. It grows at about the tempo of population growth. Not exactly, but close enough that it's the best form of money anyone's ever discovered. But the problem with Bitcoin, when you hit a hard stop, which they will, and the economy keeps growing, but you want to back it with Bitcoin, so here's your money supply and here's your economy, that's inherently deflationary, right? Because each Bitcoin's got to support more and more growth, meaning your Bitcoin is worth more in theory. But the problem is you never get there. Why? Because if you have a deflationary currency, there's no bond market. The money supply grows based on credit, based on loans, based on various forms of borrowing. The money supply is just a foundation and, the, and the, the, the economy grows with credit, nobody wants to borrow in a form of money that's going to be more expensive when you pay it back. I'm not talking about interest. That's always part of the equation. But I'm saying the money itself is, um, is worth more when you have to pay back the loan. No one's going to borrow in that loan, therefore no bond market, therefore no viable form of money. So these are all the reasons why this is going to hit the wall. Uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening you know, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain. You know we all remember headline: you know, supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, or tripled the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what do, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like, who wants to buy, you know, summer dress in uh, December? Not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices, uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness. The, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which. 
uh, is is not a good measure of, um, of what's going on in the labor force. So we're flying into a really bad recession. But, you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of it. Some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd. You know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the Nasdaq dropped 80%. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates. We're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did, uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows it's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, unemployment's going to go up. He said that. He tied unemployment to um, killing, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake-up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now what Powell, which is their target, so what Powell said is we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive, a restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say, forecasting the Fed's the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now, the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So, so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. And but the second fallacy is even bigger: is tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Bear market rallies are are really interesting some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything but for a couple of days or weeks even uh, uh it's hey the bottom's in and you buy stocks etc so you have you have to watch out for that so so my expectation is the recession's coming it's going to be really bad um inflation is going to come down fast but not quite fast enough for the fed uh, they're going to keep raising rates destroying demand raising unemployment and we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours, actually. And I was, you know, I was in the room with the Treasury and Italian Finance Ministry and 19 banks and you know, a thundering herd of lawyers. Trying to trying to save the world, but uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. There was a four billion dollar all cash, you know, you could, you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just, hey, the Fed wants us to do this, so let's just do it. Um, so uh, so that worked, 
but um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And you know they would have opened days later, but that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in 2008. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was, and that's that confuses a lot of people because, and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference, there are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan- an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now Nasdaq collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in Nasdaq. There was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't. No banks, no banks failed. No major brokerages failed, etc. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987. Interesting. Stock market fell 22 percent in one day. Not a week or a month, but one day down 22 percent, and that was a financial crisis. But there was no there was no recession, uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together, and 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together. It was it was horrific, but um, but they can happen separately. My my point is, we may have. Um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. But 2008 is a model, and that may be what we're heading for. Bearing in mind that these are two separate vectors. There were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above five percent. Five percent is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a twenty percent default rate, which is which ne- has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a twenty percent default rate would be a two hundred billion dollar loss, which was only slightly higher. Than the SNL crisis of the 1980s, you know, just for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad. Banks will take losses. Stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is, yes, there was one trillion dollars of、uh, subprime mortgages, but there were six trillion dollars of derivatives. Yeah, that was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20 percent of that was 1.2 trillion. So you, you create derivatives out of thin air. Yeah. Uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company. I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008 it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998, and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008, and we're going to fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? And as the point is, each crisis is bigger than the one before. The、uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts, and are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And、uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, "Okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com- complexity theory and capital markets, how that works. But where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst?" It's actually a long list. Now, student loans. There are 1.6 trillion dollars worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis. You know, how does the how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into To debt and deficits.、Uh, so when、um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody, a university makes a loan to a student, and the treasury、uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget.、Uh, again, it's 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 not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults,、um, and the credit union, the lender, simply turns to the treasury and said, "Here's here's your loan file. Pay me." And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. 
analysis on the Treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the Treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're gonna converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York. But she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy? The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105% highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%, 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory, and he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so. You proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus, we wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may, have, we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was to, dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand, and I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here, I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. 
Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, buy a new car, buy a house. Get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land, real estate, um, and natural resources. They're all good. Uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The the you know the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All of these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory.